we're starting four minutes. We're early. I like that. You're punctual. Stru- that's a good. That's a good. Uh, good thing in your column, Zach. That you're. You know, if you're on start, time, right? if you're on time, you're late. Only in person, though, not on the phone. Oh, if, really? if I phone oh, because calls, you did. Yeah, you the know. phone calls. You were a little. You've experienced that. You were a little suspect, I will say. <laughs> when it comes to meetings, I like to be early. You can ask my kids. There, we go. We go to a practice or a game. They know we're showing up 15 minutes before they're supposed to be there. Really? Oh yeah. So why is it different on the phone with you? I don't know. I just I'm not good at the organization of phone calls and calendars and. That's oh. surprising because how you one do one thing is how you do everything. So I'm surprised that you are one way there and then so different the other way. Interesting. I think it's I'm poorly organized, but I can't stand being late to something. Okay. Well, Zach Smith, welcome to the Carrie Cross Show. Thank you for having me. You know, I we do we probably should tell the story about how I broke up with you first. Yeah, absolutely. Don't you think we should? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so you know I'm new at this. I'm a baby podcaster. I've only been doing this since January. So I'm still trying to get my footing, like what am I doing? And yeah. when the word got out that I was having you on the show. There were a couple people that were a little like, ooh, I don't know if you should be having this guy on your show. And it freaked me the F out. So I FaceTimed you and I broke up with you. You did. Did I hurt your feelings at all? No, not at all. I mean, I was disappointed because how this came about is I saw you, Kirk Barton came on here and I saw your show and I was like, wow, this is, I, this is really good. Like, I would love to do that show. And I don't ever try to go on a show, but I was like, her show's really good. Like I would, that would be a good conversation. So I was bummed I didn't get to do it, but you have to understand like the last four or five years, like that is a common theme around the city. Yeah. It it wasn't like how, oh no, how could she? Like, I was like, yeah, that's kind of how it is. That's kind of how my life goes. Yeah. So let me, you know, so I'll go finish kind of how this all then came full circle. So I don't like to be told what to do. I've <laughs> always gone against the grain, not not just for the sake of going against the grain. I've just marched to my own drum. And part of doing this show, it's like you have to be open to criticism. And so when I broke up with you on FaceTime and you're really cool about it, I, you know, you, you I kept thinking about it. Yeah. And, and, and like, so I thought maybe I just was like feeling bad. Like, not yeah. that I felt like it was like such a ho- big thing for you, but I was like, it, it just, the whisper didn't go away. And then finally one day I was running and I was kind of annoyed. I'm like, why am I letting other people yeah. dictate my content? Like if I want to have someone on my show, it doesn't mean I align with you. It doesn't no, mean I right. agree with you. Right. It doesn't, I mean, I can have you on my show if I want. This is yeah. America. Yeah. This is my show. Right. So I texted you. I'm like, yeah, five minutes to talk. Sure, FaceTimed you again and said, hey, do you want to come back on the show? And you graciously accepted. So thank you. Well, I appreciate you having me on, like I said. To be fair, it was like a breakup. Like, you know, it's just not a good time for me. It wasn't like we're not compatible (laughs) type of breakup, right? It was more like it's not a good time, but maybe in the future. Yeah. So I didn't feel like it was a clean break. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so are we ready to like jump into this? Let's jump in. So the first thing, though, that I want to get into is being Earl Bruce's grandson, like being what we call born on third. Mm -hmm. You were born between third and home. Yeah, for sure. Right? And so you acknowledge that, the privilege that you had. Oh, no question. So I'm trying, when I go back and look at everything that happened, you know, circa 2012 through, what was it, 18? Yeah. um, And the shit show that ensued and just all the stuff that you were involved in, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you were were in a pile of poo. Oh, yeah. Everywhere you looked, right? Yeah. And so I, I, I try, I'm, I'm, I'm very much someone who likes to reflect. So here we are mm-hmm. years later, and I'm hoping that with distance between the story, we can maybe get into like the, the Zach now versus mm-hmm. the Zach then yeah, and kind absolutely. of talk through that. Being born on third doesn't mean that you can't be good at something. It no, doesn't actually. mean that you can't succeed, but it does mean that you have a privilege that really no one else has. Oh, absolutely. You're four years old. You're on the field at Ohio State. You're full access pass into greatness. Yeah. That's your grandpa. He's holding, you know, he's putting you on his lap and then you're watching him mm-hmm. dominate. Like that That had to really create some sort of narrative in your head. Yeah. Right? That That other people, did you get it? No, not a clue. I mean, I did you know, I didn't, I didn't understand at all until I was probably 13, which would have been like 1997. So he's long, he's been retired from coaching for a couple years and he was back in Columbus and him, him and my grandmother used to take us to get school clothes. And we went to the mall 
to go buy some clothes for school and people kept like saying, Hey coach, Hey coach. And then I'm just kind of looking around like all these people know him. Like you, you live in such a bubble that you don't really grasp like what you're doing or what, who your grandfather really is. Like, you know, he's the head coach at Ohio state or at Colorado state. And you know that you realize there's people, you know, all these people in the stands, but it's just, it's the only, only life, you know. Right. And so I didn't really realize it until then I was a teenager and I remember a number of people coming up to us, us at the mall and I was like, yo, he's, he's really famous. I didn't, I just thought he was a football coach, no different than a, an accountant or like my dad was an accountant. It was no difference to me other he did it in front of people that like to watch the players. I guess I didn't fully grasp what coaching was. Like I knew that Arch Schleister was a, was a big time player and all the fans loved him, right? Or, you know, fast forwarding to the nineties, Eddie George, but the coaching aspect of it, I was just kind of like, yeah, he just coaches them. He's not a big deal. And I didn't really realize how big of a deal that being a college football coach was to the mass, the masses of college football fans. So then when you did start to get it, how did that manifest with you? Was there arrogance there? Was there were you humble? Were you like, I'm Earl Bruce's grandson, I am above the law? Like, how did you as a teenager, when we're all idiots, yeah. frontal lobe isn't right. completely developed, right. did you kind of puff your chest out a I bit? I kind of shied away from it. Like, I, Not that it was, it was not embarrassing, but it was almost like I didn't want people to know me as that, right? And so I, I'll never forget, even in high school, like, I mean, my close friends knew that he was my grandfather, but I, I was at a freshman football practice, and I'll never forget it because he showed up to watch. And I mean, players, the coaches are like, what the hell is Earl Bruce doing here? Like, no idea that I was his grandson or anything. And they all started, all of a sudden, they all fanboyed out. And I'm like, I, I was a... I was embarrassed in a good way. It's going to put attention on me. And and I never really wanted that. I mean, like you said, it, being born as Earl Bruce's grandson certainly opened incredible doors for me that I took full advantage of. And I have no shame in doing that. But I, I, I was never like, I never like thrived in that or, or, or was never cocky about it. Like it, to me, it was something that's like, yeah, he is. But like, I, I don't really want that to be how people reference me or know me even as a high school kid, like 14 years old. Do you, was coaching always your dream or do you think that, like did that suit you and your personality naturally or was it like, okay, I'm Earl Bruce's grandson. This is an opportunity I'd be stupid to not kind of take. Yeah. Did you feel authentic in that role? Um, I was kind of raised by my mom and her sisters. She, you know, he had four daughters where they talked about it in a, in a very like, you know, two different lights. Like it was very fun going on bowl trips and your dad's the coach and this, but they also talked about a very different side of it where he was never there. Like my grandmother, his wife became a bad, a bad alcoholic. And like a lot of the, the things that don't get talked about when you talk about this celebrity football coach, it's like, there's, there's a lot of really hard things that go with it. So I kind of had a negative connotation in my mind about it. Not that I didn't want to do it, but it just seemed like, I don't know if I want to do that mm -hmm. until I was probably 17 or so. And we went to lunch and one of his former players was at the same place, the old easy living right there in upper Arlington, right, right off campus. And one of his former players was there. He came over, said hi to him because he played for him. And then he looked at me and he said, that man right there changed my life forever. And I'll, I'll never forget it because I was like, wow, I get it now. Like, that's really cool. He was able to do that, not just that guy, but like over and over. Like you, however many kids you have, you can impact those lives. But he, he grabbed so many kids and changed the trajectory of their lives. And I've heard it. I mean, in the last whatever, I was probably seventeen then. So the last twenty-two years, I can't even tell you how many times I heard it. And that's when I said, I want to, I want to do that. Like that's what I want to do. I didn't care about being a coach at Ohio State or whatever, but I just said, I want to, I want to impact kids like that. I want to coach kids. That's what I want to do. I walked on at Bowling Green. I was not a college football player. I was an, I was a good high school player. I, I got a walk-on spot because Urban Meyer coached for my grandfather. I walked on at Bowling Green with the sole and I didn't think I was going to play in the NFL. I was not naive. I was not an idiot. I knew that this was like a means to get in a college football program and see what it's like and just learn that. And so I went there my freshman year. And when Urban left and went to Utah, I hated Bowling Green. 
It just wasn't for me. And I called my grandfather. And I was like, hey, I, I want to transfer. Like, Urban's gone. Your guy's gone. Like, I want to transfer. So I went to Kentucky, which is where I had some friends going. They had a much better freshman experience than I had. And so I went to be just a normal college student. But I told him, I said, I still want to coach. And it was calculated. I was like, I know you are friends with Rich Brooks, who's the head coach. I said, can you make a phone call and see if I can volunteer there doing anything? And he did. And I volunteered there. I can't even say I, I was never in a meeting. I was never at a practice, but I would go in and help do like mundane tasks about breaking down film, filling in what hash mark it's on, what quarter it is kind of back then. You look at it now and it's not like it, but um, I sound like an old man saying that, but it took a lot more grunt work to break down film back then than it does now. So I just would sit in a room by myself and help break down film. So that was my first experience being on that, the other side of a college football program. And then when Urban got hired at Florida, my grandfather called me and said, listen, if you really want to try to be a coach, you have to go down to Florida right now. And we'll see what Urban will offer you. I can't promise anything, but you have to go down there and try to get your foot in the door because this this is a great opportunity. Well, now when you say... <laughs> When he says, right. try to get your foot in the door, like, it wasn't hard to get your foot in the door. No, it wasn't hard, but it wasn't hard at all to get, I mean... Yeah, I mean, your foot was in the door. The foot was in the door, for yeah, sure. right. But it was more like, this is not something that I can just call him in a year, or he's just getting there, he's going to have full staff turnover, I can get him to find you something to do. So, did you ever feel going there under those circumstances that people were gunning for you? Did you ever feel there was resentment? Because I'm going to say, like, let's say I'm Joe Schmo off the street. I would give my left nut, right, for yeah. the opportunity oh, to absolutely. even be in the vicinity of a program like that. And then you get to be like, hey, Gramps, listen. Oh, so, yeah. Which, again, that's your that's your privilege. Yeah. You know, I'm not no, – no, no, uh, you were born Earl Bruce's grandson, right. and, and, and people would be lying to say that they don't try to help – their own in, in certain ways. So did you ever feel like this is too easy? Like this, did you have imposter syndrome? What was the feeling being able to just sort of like pack your bag and be like, yep, this is what I want to do. And then you get that opportunity so easily. It was, it was, I, I think my own intrinsic like response to it was very like, there's way more pressure on me as this unpaid intern than somebody who, however they got that opportunity, they got it, right? It's like, you, I didn't want to come off as some entitled kid who thinks he deserves this because Earl Bruce was a, a coach. It's like, no, no, no. I, I definitely had an unbelievable foot in the door and privilege to get that f first opportunity. But I took it as more like, I'm going to make sure that I become a great football coach or that this works out because I don't want it to look like, God, this guy had a freaking ridiculous opportunity and he didn't do, do anything with it. Like he, he, and honestly disrespected what my grandfather did to afford me that opportunity. That's kind of how I looked at it was, was this is my grandfather didn't have wake up on third base and he gave me this opportunity because of all the stuff he did, how disrespectful of me to come in cocky or arrogant and not work harder than anyone else and appreciate the hard work he did to gift me this opportunity. Looking back objectively on your career at Florida, what would you grade yourself? Do you think you did go in and work as hard as you possibly could have? Did you put your nose to the grindstone and work your fanny off? Like oh, what yeah. score would you give yourself scale? Objectively, one to 10. Yeah, 10. Okay. I mean, I, it, it was, I didn't know what I was getting myself into. I, th I told myself that, like, I'm going to go work extremely hard and all that. I didn't know what that meant. No idea. I mean, I'd never worked a half day, not even a quarter day compared to what I was going to do when I got there. But I was fortunate to be around two, really two GAs that are, you know, who worked 20 hour days every day. Ryan Day is one of them. And then Sean Cronin is, is the other one who's now at Army. And they were grinders. And they just kind of were like, they were very like, in a bully way, like, no, no, no. Like Ryan was like, Ryan didn't have any help. And he was like, hey, you just come with me. You're gonna you're gonna help me do everything. And so I just was like, oh okay. Like mm -hmm. I had some somebody that was a part of the staff, kind of helping me figure things out and just kind of telling me what to do, which is which was nice to not have to like figure it out. It was just like I could just shut up and do what he said. Yeah. And I didn't leave unless he left. Like I wasn't gonna leave early. And I told myself, I said, listen, I'm not gonna leave or not work hard if they're still working. I'm just gonna be here until they have something to do. And I'm, when they leave, I'll leave. Then I know at least I'm working hard, as hard as they are. <laughs> so um, 
Your first issue, though, domestically mm -hmm. with Courtney was when you guys were in Florida. Yeah. Okay. So your marriage was already, I would say, in trouble way back when you were in Florida. Yeah, definitely. That was the kind of the start of it. Um, and it was a very unique like instance. It, nothing, nothing like that had ever happened before, and nothing like that happened again for a long time. Mm -hmm. It was very... She was pregnant and she was going through a ton of emotions. Like she was having panic attacks. Like her body was going through crazy changes. And it was a disastrous night at, on top of that. But it was very isolated. It wasn't something that was like our relationship's really rocky right now. Like everything was great. We had that one night that was really awful. And then after that, it went back to being a great relationship. So it was very. Did you say great? I mean, no, I would never say great. It absolutely wasn't great. But I, I guess just, it went back to normal. Okay, what was got it. previous to that <laughs> night. It. I absolutely wouldn't say so, great. No. <laughs> so so just just checking you just checking the facts. Um was that the night that you had the coworker come home with you? Yeah. Okay, so I, I do want to park here because and I get my goal is not to go back to like no, I, yeah. every detail, but there are some that we have to talk about just from my own voyeur, you know, right. sicko curiosity. What the hell were you thinking? It wasn't that I tried to bring her home. It was that so Justin Fry, who's the O-line coach at Ohio State, his wife, Amy, was the girl that worked with mm -hmm. us, me, and there might have been one other person. We were all downtown. Courtney's pregnant. She wasn't drinking, so she went home after Urban's little staff party, and we all went out, and she told me to. And so at the end of the night, we got an Uber, one Uber, to take us all home, stop by stop. Well, my stop was the second to last stop, and she was still in the car, and she was passed out in this Uber, and I didn't know what to do. I was like, I'm trying to wake her up. I don't know where she lives. I don't know anything about her other than she's a secretary at, at Ohio State or in Florida. And so I, I was like, well, she could just crash on our couch, I guess. And and like Courtney or I could take her home in the morning. I didn't know. Horrible decision. Really, really dumb decision. <laughs> I mean, that's one of those I things. mean, I'd had plenty to drink. Right. I'm looking at it like, well, she'll understand. Like oh, she's just going to sure sleep on the she couch. Will. Uh, absolutely. Really, really dumb. Right. So you come walk stumbling in with a, a female. I'm just thinking optics. Yeah. Right. So I know what it's like to be pregnant and to have a drunk, you know, spouse. It, mm -hmm. it ain't fun. No. And and you come stumbling in with a woman. I'll tell you, I will give Courtney a lot of credit because that might have been the end of you, <laughs> yeah. like in my in my and world. Rightfully so, in hindsight. So we're gonna say we're accepting accountability for that one. Oh, like absolutely. We're, okay, we're absolute. Okay, that absolutely. was just a horrible idea. Horrible. Okay, so things go back to your normal cadence after this night, but that definitely you know set an interesting tone mm -hmm. for the marriage. Um, so then next, you end up at Ohio State. So next, I, I after I, Urban did his whole first resignation, heart issues, had the nine one one call. Um, Doc Holliday got the head coaching job at Marshall, who had worked with us at Florida, and he called me and offered me my first full-time job in Huntington, West Virginia. And so I took that job, and I'm, we moved to Huntington, had my son, and I spent 11 months there before I went to Temple, where Steve Adazio got the head coaching job, who I also worked with or worked for at Florida. I went there for about 11 months, and then Urban called to, bring, to come to Ohio State. Okay. And you gladly accepted. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now you're, you know, you got the big dick energy, right? right. You're you're at Ohio State mm -hmm. with Urban Meyer. How did that affect your ego? Oh, it definitely inflated my ego. There's no doubt. I was probably the youngest Power Five football coach in the country. I mean, it was it it inflated my ego like initially, and it got deflated really fast. Um, just the way Urban operates as a head coach, he has this had. I guess he's not coaching anymore. He had this way, and Ryan Day told me this. He, When he got done at Florida as a GA, he left and went to Temple and came back to work camp, and Urban was treating him like dog shit. And he looked at me, he goes, just so you know, once you're at this level with Urban Meyer, you'll always be at that level. He was like, no matter where you go, no matter what successes you have, you're always going to be his grunt or this. So when I got to Ohio State, a lot of new coaches, he really only knew – he only worked with two of them, me, myself and Stan Drayton. And it was like, I was just that guy that was probably, you know, too inexperienced for the job for sure, not ready for the job. He pulled me early only because he had gotten kind of backstabbed by his former receiver coach. And so he mostly wanted someone he could trust. 
mm-hmm. over. He didn't care. He and and he'd got rave reviews from his former assistants that I worked for that I was a really good coach. But there's still levels to it, right? Mm-hmm. You're a great coach at Temple doesn't mean you're going to be the one of the best in the United States of America, which is what Ohio State deserves. And so he knew I was loyal to him, that I wasn't going to quit or go anywhere else. Like, where am I going to go? I'm 27. Who, who's going to hire me from Ohio State? Like, not another big program. So he just used it as it, to his, I don't want to say to his advantage. Any opportunity that he needed to take something out on a coach, I was his example. Because what am I going to do? Well, and you had that relationship. Yeah, for sure. You know, and again, going back to you having this privilege, you know, I'm reading through these text messages between you and Urban, and I'm like, this doesn't happen. No. Like, Urban's not, Urban's like looking for you and saying, hey, where's Zach? Make sure he's, you know, Zach's not performing or where he's, it's, it's almost like you were his chai. I mean, any in the real world, you would have been fired and let go, mm-hmm. you know, but you were like... Zach, right? You're mm-hmm. where's Zachy? And and side note for Urban, what is up with his texting? Yeah, he texts. He leaves off a lot of letters. <laughs> he a lot of letters. What is that? Is this he texts like a twelve year old girl? Like he'll say, "Come see me," and it's C O M C M E. Yeah, yeah. I was actually dying when I was because I felt like you were like, you know, okay, Urban, and he's like, you know, reprimanding you. And I'm like, this shit is not real. No wonder. If you did feel invincible or if you did feel like you were above the law, no wonder. This is, I don't even know how you had a chance. In my, in my mind, truly, you would think that someone like you going to Ohio State under Urban Meyer, having Earl Bruce as your, as your grandfather would be the most incredible thing, mm-hmm. right? But that to me is such a recipe for disaster. You just didn't have the perspective. Mm-hmm. You didn't have, you You just, it was too much too soon. It that's just, was. that's my own humble opinion. It definitely was. Opinion. It was too much too soon. Like I was not ready yet to be at a, a place like Ohio State, especially with all the backstory, all the, all, everything, my whole family, all my friends, everyone lives in Columbus. That's where I'm from. It was a ton. And on top of that, walking into the situation where, the receiver room was my room was completely depleted. Urban is a receiver coach at heart. Like he, it, there was so much pressure on my room to get better fast, and I just wasn't I wasn't equipped for that or to manage Urban Meyer because it, you he, call it what it is. You have to manage him if you work for him, and it took me probably after. 2014, after we won the national championship, where I really, and Tom Herman helped me do it, like figure him out, where he does things that are just, I mean, borderline verbally abusive, like, and sent, used to send me in a tank because I had so much respect for him and wanted to, like, do a good job for him that it would just, just destroy mm-hmm. me. And Tom Herman would gra- grab me one time. He was like, you got it. You have to step out of this and watch him work because it is truly a psychological manipulation masterpiece. And it is what he does with players, the team, his coaches. And after about 2014, I used to sit back. He could say anything to me, and I'd remove myself and just think about it, and I'd watch. Like He'd blow up on the staff in a staff meeting, go crazy, and you're like, most of the people are freaking out like they're going to get fired. And I would just push pause and watch, and I'd be like, this fucking guy is brilliant because you would see grown men, 30-year careers, panicking and working like they were going to lose their jobs. But Okay, so... so, so er. <laughs> Why is that brilliant though? Well, it's, it's, I'm not, I guess it's not brilliant in a big picture, but in that bubble, getting that kind of production and getting that kind of urgency out of these coaches, it was. I, that sounds very basic to me. Like you're, you're, you're t- wielding your, I mean, he's the head coach of Ohio State, so you're, you're wielding your authority, right? Yeah. But it's like, I don't know. I would think there would be more strategic ways to I do it. Like I'm more of a trestle style. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. that to me. When you when you go back and you say, you know, this is a psychological mastermind or whatever, that's a trestle to me. Yeah. And maybe I'm just dumbing it down. Again, I know nothing. He, he he's he's the most reactionary and unintentional leader ever. Oh, okay. Which it's, it is, it is literally nine one one fourth and fourth and one every situation. It's the most dramatic response mechanism in human form. Interesting. All right. But I digress. So did you know, like, did you have internal dialogue where you're like, I am so out of my depth here? Like, did you ever panic? I mean, this is a big job. You're, you're 
you know, in the public eye and you kind of feel like maybe this job is a little, were you like, holy shit, like, what am I doing here? No, it was more for me. Like I, I got to, I got to figure this shit out. Like I got to get better and better and better and figure out how, how I'm going to become an Ohio state coach that, that should be here. And I think it, it took, I mean, the first year it was brutal by 2013. I was competent. And by 2014, I was, I would call myself one of the better receiver coaches in the country. So, but it was, it was more a kind of internal look and say, all right, I'm going to get fired if I just if I'm yeah. don't, if I don't become one of the best coaches in the country at my position, I'm going to get fired mm -hmm. for sure. So I got to figure this out. So it doesn't take a genius hearing this mm -hmm. and understanding the time, the energy, the ego. I mean, your whole world's wrapped up in this. Mm -hmm. And so now you got a wife at home, and we all know what happens there under normal circumstances. You start having kids. Life is mundane. She's bitching to you about everything she should be bitching to you about, but you can't, you're in a pressure cooker. You guys were in a very extraordinary circumstance mm -hmm. that just, it, it is inevitable that it was probably going to blow. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, when I look at some of this stuff with you, um, I mean, let's just, let's just go, let's start, let's pull one out of the hat. Hold on. Let's pull it out of the hat. Dick pics. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, we got to talk about the dick pics. <laughs> But that's about. okay. That's okay. If you like to show it, it's fine. I know a lot of people that do dick pics. Yeah, right. There's no shame in that. I right. have no judgment of the DP. Yes. But <laughs> but let's tie this back to privilege, born on third, mm -hmm. not under really understanding, um, not really understanding uh the privilege that you had being there mm -hmm. to to take a pick like that mm -hmm. in certain in certain scenarios. Yeah. It's almost like you're like, yeah, you know what? <laughs> yeah. And here's my dick too. Like I I know it. I, yeah. I you don't. I mean, I I can tell you with a hundred percent certainty that you got off on the fact that you could do that. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. But but let's. T I want to talk about yeah, the, the thought about process it. behind it. Uh -huh. So. You like to do that. You like to, 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 to like, you do that today too, like with your wife? Like you go, oh, like, absolutely. Okay, that's there's, great. There's an element of exhibition. To but like the White House. Yeah. Let's talk about that. It's f Listen. It, because you can. Because, Because yes. you can. Yes. And, and, and I, and like, that's, that's it though. Like what I see with men in power positions who have all this limelight and authority and it's like you're un touchable, right? Yeah. So that was you. To and, an extent, but... Well, you could say to an extent all you want, but you're like, okay, let me trump this, pull it out. Hey, my house, what up? <laughs> like, it, I find it to be just telling Yeah. to the bigger picture. For sure. It, and there, there's an element of that to it, but it was more like, all right, I, I was having these extramarital relationships and there was a lot of sexting involved, photos being exchanged, and it was one of those things when, when I was at the White House, I got a text or something, or maybe a, a picture, I don't know. And I was just sitting there. I was like, what, what is a dick? Like, what are you doing a dick pic? Like, there's no, like women can wear lingerie. They can do all this, like all this shit to look, like, what are you doing with a dick pic? It kind of is what it is. And so I was sitting in the White House and I went to the bathroom and they had these White House napkins with the seal on it. And I was like, now who's taking a dick pic in the White House? Nobody, right? And so you. And so I'm sure there's been plenty of people that I'm have sure there have. with the, the governments that we've had. Yes. But it was just kind of something that was like, this would be epic. Uh-huh. And it, so it certainly it. was, right? Certainly. Well, I didn't know it was going to become public knowledge. I, it was not something I was like, oh, this will be epic when people find out. You must be very proud of what's going on down there. <laughs> I don't know. If I, I don't know if it's about proud of what's going if on. If you down were there. like, a, you know, if you were like, had a problem down there, you may not be pulling it out. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Duly noted. Now that we're in this this twisted, you know, you know, sexual space, yeah. let's stay there for a moment. Yeah. So let's talk about the sex toys. The easy thing is to say because I saw the cart, the Amazon cart, yeah. right, and I was like, yeah. oh my god, what the? And then the easy thing is to say they were gag gifts, right? Which again, I don't, I have no, zero no, no. judgment against anything anybody wants to do, right? But I want to talk through. Do you really wear those suspenders? And if you do, just own suspenders. it. Like it had like the, it almost looked like the banana hammock with the oh jock straps. That's all I wear. So what is that? It's just underwear. No, it had like suspenders coming up like oh, this. Oh, God, no. 
No, that was that was a gag gift. So it, what happened was, before, and I didn't know this was going on, but every Amazon order I ever had was getting compiled into this like list of, of degenerate things that I had ordered. And I ordered everything to the office. I mean, not it was not like just sex toys or just underwear. It was anything in the world I ordered on Amazon got delivered to the office because I was there so much. Now, pr- and I, not even in hindsight, I knew at the time, really dumb to order personal things to the office. That's pretty pretty stupid. But it comes in a bl- in a brown box that gets put in my office. I didn't really care. Yeah. Um, there was there were certain things, and I, I don't know that I've ever looked through the entire list, but I know what I've stuff I've ordered. There were certain things that were gag gifts that I've never, like I either gave to someone for a bachelor party or, or I've never, you know, there were some things that that were a little more maybe risque in male underwear form that I have worn, but the majority of it was very standard. <laughs> like jockstrap underwear that I wear every day. I wear wearing today. So you never really ordered any sex toys to use with one of your people you're having an affair with? No, never. I'm ne- no, never once. And then do you still stand by the fact that you didn't ever have sex in your office? No, I've never said that. I never had s- sex with anyone that I worked that with. That you worked with, yeah. yeah oh, no, you I, had sex in the office. Oh, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, but I, I you were just I mean you were just having a heyday I'm, there. I'm a at, sexual person. You I don't were, know what to I, say. It's not about that. It's more about where like you're like. But you just know. so we're clear, now okay, getting sex toys, all that stuff delivered to the office, probably pretty unique. But a lot of the other stuff that has come out or that is alleged or reported or true is so rampant in college football. Yeah. It's not. I, I'm looking like what this is a big deal. I saw our D coordinator at X Y Z school do that. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's 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 not an uncommon thing. I'm not doubting that at all. And in fact, I believe that. Yeah. Going back to the whole men in power thing. Yeah. I believe, unfortunately, that a lot of these coaches, uh, you guys probably point to the ones that do it well, and you're like, man, that's a real family guy. Because yeah. I, yeah. I I guarantee, just with the nature of being away and having this, you know, power position, it's got to be hard to turn away from. Yeah. So I don't think you are, I do not think you're special or unique in that way. Now being removed from it, I I even, I read headlines and I hear about it and I'm like, ooh, in the real world, that sounds really bad. But the world I was just living in, that was, I don't want to say common practice, but that was not super abnormal. Okay, so as, as your marriage continues to deteriorate, you continue to have now some more volatile... Mm -hmm. situations with Courtney. So do you still, to this day, stand by the fact that you never touched Courtney other than to defend yourself against her coming at you? Yeah, I defended myself from her and restrained her if she was physically angry. So there was never a time where you got super angry and maybe just did something in anger before she did anything to you. Because it's hard, here's where I get tripped up with this, but it's hard to believe that two human beings who were under this pressure cooker, struggling with this dynamic, Mm -hmm. right? That every single time it was just her coming for you where you didn't at some point here and there maybe do it first. The people have convicted you of basically doing something first, right? There's no avoiding that. True, not true, doesn't matter. It's that is that is the reality that most people probably are just that's what they believe and there's nothing you can do about it. Now, obviously, every instance was different. I don't know how many how many times things got you know crossed the line, like like got too heated. Yeah. Um, but I, but I know that the most physical in in response I've ever been was that one time at Florida, and it scared me to death. One, I went to I, I got arrested for it, and two, it was one of those I, I've never put my hands on a woman ever and and I was sleeping in the bed and she came in after the whole occurrence with bringing the girl home in the Uber and I'd been drinking I'm passed out and she's just hitting me telling me to get out of the bed punching me throws water on me and finally I was just so annoyed I got up and I just grabbed her I said get out of the room and I like like pushed her back with and and she just like fell backwards and I was like oh I like holy shit like I just like pushed her off out the door and she fell down and she was pregnant. I mean, it was a horrible, horrible experience. And then I got arrested. And after that, I was like, I'll never, ever do that again. And so any other time it ever happened that things got heated, things got physical, 
I left. I slept at the office at the Woody probably five, six, seven times in the three years we were here in Columbus and we were married. For me, seeing the pictures, reading what I've read, you know, it's hard to believe that maybe you didn't kind of blow your gasket here and there and, and initiate something. Yeah. But well, that's I, just... So, so here, th this is me being inquisitive. What, what about any picture that, you, that you've seen would, would indicate otherwise? Well, so correct. When I see a photo, I can't tell who initiated it. Right. But I feel like with Courtney, I... And again, this is a total uneducated opinion. Yeah. I feel like she was a woman scorned. Mm -hmm. isolated, lonely. She oh, didn't absolutely. feel seen or heard. Yep. Um, very hurt. But I don't I don't liken her to be like this calculated mastermind manipulative person who's no. out to destroy you and oh, make no. up lies. And so when she's sitting down telling her story and she's being very authentic about mm -hmm. what happened and what she says is, you know, Zach initiated this situation and this is what happened. I'm going to take her at that word because I don't know most women aren't going to sit there and try to contrive mm -hmm. that type of story. Yeah. I feel like it's a really unfortunate situation that you guys got into for all the reasons we were talking about. Mm -hmm. You're both human. You're both flawed. I don't think you're a bad person. I don't think you're a woman beater. Right. I don't think you should be forever canceled or labeled that. Right. I don't believe that. Right. But I do believe that you probably did some things that you're not proud of that you're too afraid to maybe say, you know mm. what, maybe I did initiate that one. Mm. Like, I, it's not for me. That's for between you and her and the good Lord above, right? Yeah, right. I feel like the truth is like the sun. It'll always come out. Mm -hmm. And I do think, though, if that was the case with you, like, let's say you do know in like this little nook and cranny in the mm -hmm. back of your head, like, you know what, there was a time. She's right. Yeah. I did do that. Yeah. I do think that's a forgivable, forgivable offense, to, if you own it, yeah, right, and you don't do that again, right. So I, it, 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 that's between you. But I do believe her mm -hmm. in her statements that yeah. she's made. I don't think she's perfect, but I, I do believe what she says about those things that happened to her. Right. Which means I don't believe you. <laughs> True. Which is which, fine. Which I mean, I, I don't think a lot of people probably do. No, they don't. You know, except your echo chamber. Right. It's one of those things where you really have to. I mean, you, you'd, you'd have to be there in a very unbiased role. Like you can't listen to her. You really can't listen to me because both both sides have a very, very strong reasoning for what they're doing, mm -hmm. right? The, the, the response to it. Yeah. And I would say that the people that, the, the closest people that do know, do know. Mm -hmm. And- But they don't really, because they, they weren't don't there. Really. They right. weren't there. Right. And so they your don't. people that love you are going to be biased towards you because they want to believe mm -hmm. you. And the people who love her are going to be biased towards her because they love her and they want to believe her. I'm going with common sense and with, yeah. you know, I mean, look at O.J. Simpson, for example. I mean, it's a whole different thing, right? Yeah. But O.J. walks around and says what? He didn't do it. Yeah, do you right. think O.J. killed Nicole? I don't. Okay. Okay, only because I have always said O.J. did it and the police screwed the investigation up and gave way too much to his defense attorneys uh -huh. and he got off uh -huh. and that's the system worked because they screwed it up. But I, I've always thought he did it until I watched the documentary about his son, how, how he was this sous chef and, and, and all the things that, that I can't even remember all the details, but this documentary convinced me that OJ's son did it and he took the fall for his son. I've never even heard that. I oh must, my God, you I, have I, to I'm going to need to go. There's always some kind of conspiracy theory, there right? Is. Okay, well, I think OJ definitely did it, but I'll have to look at it. I'll, I'll shelf that for now, and I will, I'll will i educate myself on the OJ thing. <laughs> um, okay, so one more thing before we move on from the from the Courtney saga. You end up in jail, and we mm -hmm. won't go into all the details. I know it was because she was at school, you were at school, whatever. But the reason why I'm asking about that is I'm just curious about your experience at jail. Wild. I, right. So you Wild. got 180 days, and then they suspended 160, so you end up with with what, 20 or 19 days? So I was, I, I spent a night in jail the first, when I first got arrested. And then the next day got out, obviously had to have a trial and then got 19. So I had 20, but I already served one. I got time served. I know. You guys, <laughs> I read that. You got 24 well, hours time you, served. You'll get credit for time served. I was like, holy shit. Who never, I've gone I never thought I'd hear that I've statement. gone and done it. I did it. Um, it was wild. And I mean, brutally miserable at the time. You know, getting your freedom taken away is something I never anticipated happening to me. And in, in hindsight, what an experience. I mean, the people I met, 
like some of their stories mm -hmm. and like cr some crazy people. Did it, you have a roommate? Oh, no, no, no. This was a... Were you by yourself? There was 20 people in, in one room. Oh, I see. And you never left the room. Like you could, there, there was no... I've, I've heard all the r stories and laws that you get, have to have like exercise time. You were in one room. It was a big, big room for all 19 days. Never left. Did you have some real low points in there? Like some self-reflective, like, hey, self, here we are. I mean, we <laughs> really went and did it. No, not at that point. I, I had that... I really had that after I got divorced... And and I hit rock bottom about twenty fifteen ish twenty about in between twenty fifteen and twenty sixteen was when I really had those conversations. It, it, be, when I got put in jail, I knew what happened. I knew what it was. I knew the trajectory of my life, where it was going. Now I had just been fired, so I didn't know what I was doing. But I knew the I knew the things that I was doing in my everyday life, my routine, kind of who I was as a person, and I knew where I was heading. And so it was just. A really, really screwed up situation. So go back to when you hit rock bottom. So talk mm. through when you went super low, where you mm. like sat with yourself and you're like, okay, regardless of who did what, because we you, everybody's guilty of this. You mm -hmm. get into a situation and there's drama and it's all these sides and you're so f busy trying to defend yourself and in the mix and the drama. But then when everything settles and you're alone with yourself and the reality of where you are in life, mm -hmm. what was that like? Was it depression? Was it anxiety? Was it like yeah. talk through the lowest that you were and what yeah, that was, it was like? I mean, it was very lonely and the only it was lonely. I was depressed. You know, mainly not seeing my kids. That was what I, I already got to see them so little coaching. And then having to be on a parenting plan that restricted it further was really hard. Um, moving out, living alone was was difficult just because you're so used to having a family, having, you know, you go home and there's things going on. There's people there. Um, it was really lonely. And it was really, I had taken, I had started taking Adderall when I was at Florida. And that was right about then was when I just started, I, I would, take extra Adderalls to stay up and work or focus on things, which, which Adderall, I mean, I don't know if you want to get into it, my thoughts on Adderall, but I feel like I'm an expert now. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't have the time I would focus on some, the dumbest thing in the world for three hours that was totally unproductive and low on a priority list. But that's what it, that's what it became. I started, I started drinking more often. I didn't cook for myself. So if I was going to go home, I'd stop at the little restaurant right where I lived and eat and drink and then take an Adderall, go home, look at recruiting rankings, watch recruiting films, stay up till all hours of the night, have to go back in the next day. And it became a vicious cycle, really bad. And that was when I hit rock bottom was then I was, I had moved in with my dad in, in his apartment at this apartment complex. And I'm still this coach at Ohio state, this high level job, but when I leave that job, I'm going to an apartment that, and just drinking and taking these extra amphetamines that is just, all it is is legal meth. I mean, it's not, it, 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 just, it just became a train wreck, a disaster. And I've always said, I, I, reflecting on my career at Ohio State, I could have been fired after 2012 for sure. Incompetence, not ready for the job. Probably, I don't know if I should have been. Because, you know, it's early in the tenure, maybe try to see if I become a great coach. By 2013, 2014, I was, a, I was a pretty good coach. Like, I belonged there. 2015, and then I got divorced, and my life became a train wreck. Late to work, because I was up till 4 in the morning, taking Adderall, watching recruiting film. or not. That was the productive side. Sometimes it would be like, oh, I was building a workbench mid-season at 2 in the morning, because that's what I was focused on as I'm on this high of methamphetamine legal prescribed drugs. And it was, that's what I should have been fired in 2016. I was train wreck, late to work. There's all, all kinds of stuff. Probably all been reported. I don't know. Well, that that's like when all. Urban was kind of sending those text messages, was, kind of like checking in on you when anybody else and, would have been like, you know, hit the road. Yeah. And, and, and I had gotten so good at, in, in its own right at recruiting that when I went on the road recruiting, I knew exactly what I needed to do to sign four great players. And that was all, I mean, mm -hmm. he only needs you to sign two and I would sign four. So I knew he wouldn't be on me about recruiting. And so I would do what I needed to do. And that was it. I wasn't doing anything else. I wasn't going out trying to find more. It was just, I'm going to get my four players and be done. And so he had all these rules about you had to go to this many schools and that. And so I would just make it up. I'd be like, yeah, I went to these seven schools. Really, I only went to three, the three that matter. And so I started lying to Urban. 
And it, it got to the point where Greg Schiano flew down to go see a safety with me. And I didn't know this at the time, but he had found out that I didn't go to a school that I said I did. And so Greg came down and we're, we went to the school, saw the kid, we're driving back, getting off the exit of a highway and he pulls over on the shoulder. And he goes, hey, what's going on? I was like, what do you mean? He was like, well, Urban knows you haven't been going to the schools you say. And he starts detailing all the things that Urban knows that I've been doing in this absolute disaster life I've been living. And he was like, I'm here. He was going to fire you. And I told him, coach, let me fly down there and spend a couple hours with him and talk to him before you do. I just started bawling, crying. Greg, grown, grown man, right, as they say. And I just told him, I said, I, my life's a train wreck and I can't get out of this. I don't know what to do. And I had decided after that that I would never take Adderall did again, and I'd never, I, I, I have never. But Urban, may, when when Greg kind of presented to him what was actually going on, Urban was like, "Listen, you're going to rehab, or or else it's over." And I and he was like, "I'm only doing this because I think you could be a great football coach, and I think your kids deserve this more than you do." They don't deserve to get their dad fired. Where does your career go from here? Your kids deserve this more than you do. And so I'm going to I'm gonna mandate that you pay $20,000 to go to this inpatient rehab facility for 10, 14 days, whatever it was. And then I'm going to drug test you. If, if, Adderall, if you start taking Adderall again, you're done because I'm not going down this train wreck path again with one of my coaches. And so that's what I did. And I never took it again. And that's when really everything turned around. Um, Ryan Day got hired. I started doing, I, I think I was one of the better coaches on his staff. And so I always tell people this, and it's, it's, I believe this as deep as I can with as much conviction as I can. I deserve to get fired in 2016. The fact that I got fired in 2018 when I was 14 times the coach I ever was at Ohio State is just so, I had a meeting with Urban a month earlier about taking over the office of coordinator job when Ryan left and becoming a head coach. Like my, like, Finally, I was on the right trajectory and doing well, and then I got fired. And I was, and I deserve to get fired. It's a, I didn't deserve to get fired when I got fired. That's just the issue. So closing the loop on Courtney, mm -hmm. looking back at all of this now that you've had time mm -hmm. and wisdom, like have you have you ever sat with her and just truly apologized? Oh, there's no no. It's not even possible. You don't think that she would even be open to mm -hmm. if you never. No. You don't think so, or have you have you tried? No, I mean, there's no, there's no, no, no way to try. I mean, there's no way to. Would you be? Would that be something though? That is that something in your heart where it's like I'm not saying that you go to Courtney and say I was wrong about everything. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking more for the kids, for you guys, for your new partners. You know, I look at this from a very human perspective of, you know, nobody out there listening to this knows what it's like to be where you guys were. Clearly, the two of you didn't handle it mm -hmm. well. That being said, if one of you could potentially just extend an olive branch of, you know what, I, I'm seven years removed from this. I've had a ton of time to reflect. Something we've done really right together are these beautiful children mm -hmm. And I would love the opportunity to sit with you for 10 minutes and just apologize. Do you don't think that she would ever at least entertain something like that? Oh, but she's already gotten the apology for everything that went on in our marriage. So you I, have apologized. And I've taken the blame for the entire marriage being a train wreck because of my job, because of how I reacted to my job, because of my infidelities, because of how I was as a husband. I've owned mm. all of it to her and apologized in 2016. So you did apologize. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay, so my Oprah Winfrey moment is, you know, not going to work. Like your kids right now are too young to sort of process all of it oh, yeah. because they're in it. They're in their childhood yeah. and they're they're doing their thing. It's when you sort of get older um, yeah. that that sort of relationship between the two of you will have its effects yeah. on the kids. So right. I just, in my mind, I'm like, look, yeah. if there's any way that you could somehow, I'm you know. You. And, and I don't know what that is, but kind of my approach has been in the last four years or so, because that's probably 2016's what, seven years ago? In the last four years or so, 
since I'm around my kids a lot more mm -hmm. now, has been more just like, all right, everything when my kids are around in the house, I will never disparage her. I won't say anything negative about her. I will I'll always talk about her positively. Justine and I talk about her all the time about she will always talk about her positively. Like we're we're just gonna try to do our job to keep her in a positive light in our house. And if, she, and if when they go to her house, she chooses a different route, I can't control that. No, right. And so that's kind of where I'm at now. I'm like, you know what? I talk, I'm like, hey, call your mom and tell her about your hit. Like I try to t get them to see, like, I want you to be involved with her. And I don't know if that's right, but that's what I'm doing. All right, moving along. Yeah. Um, back to your grandpa. Mm -hmm. So when all of this is going on, because um, what he passed away in 2018. Yeah. So he was he was witness to some of this yeah. stuff, yeah. right? D did you feel like you let him down? Did you were the, was oh, there yeah. a moment between you where you felt like did he what did he say to you? What was the moment with him where he's like, "Man, what are you doing?" You know, hindsight, I mean, hindsight being 2020, he was around 2 years away from dying. He wasn't his normal self. Um and I wish he was cuz it would have been much easier to get just my ass ripped and just get absolutely destroyed. But to see him like, just like care and be like, you got to change. You got to, you got to get right. You got to do this was almost more heartbreaking than anything because shit, two years earlier than that or any point before that, it would have been that, you know, depression era grandfather just hits you in the back of the head and beats your ass and tells you to do your shit right. And that's probably, I don't know if, I, I don't know if that would have worked though. I don't know, seeing him the way he was and the, the one time that, that Urban brought him in to tell him, hey, this is going on. I just want you to know, cause I might have to fire him and I don't want anything to come between us. And, and he, he and Urban told him, he said, this is, I told him this is his last, his last straw here or else he's out. And to just to see how it wasn't even, he wasn't even upset or mad. He just cared. And it was really hard to see. So yeah, I felt like I, I, I mean, I, I felt like I couldn't have disappointed him anymore. Hmm. That had to be really hard. It was. And you know, now that we're sitting here, your dad gets overshadowed. Uh, you know, we've, yeah. we've, we've talked about your grandpa this yeah. whole time. So what was your dad's take on all of this? Did he throw you against the wall or what's his no, approach? That's not really his parenting no? style. We would talk about it and he would like try to give me advice and, and tell me, but I'm pretty stubborn and pretty strong-willed. Not that I, I value my dad, what my dad says, but that's not his style. To you, had to, you had to learn the hard way. Learn the hard way. And learn the hard way you did, Zach Smith. But I'm still here, so. You are. And so now turn. we're going to turn, pivot a little bit, yeah. right, into something a little more positive mm -hmm. in your life now and kind of some of the things you're doing, which I think is great. Yeah. Um, watching you on YouTube, I'm like, okay, all right, so this feels like an authentic Zach Smith. Like maybe mm. he was always meant to be this like contrarian, yeah. blow the whistle guy. Yeah, you're very confident. Mm -hmm. You have like this. You almost have like this WWE wrestling persona meets <laughs> like a, you get like real. Is anybody tell you that you get real? No, arr, arr, you're no gonna, like, but it's absolutely accurate. Like you're gonna take somebody down. I'm like, yeah. okay. So you know, did you feel? Like I, you feel like you're in your authentic self doing that. I can tell. Mm -hmm. Did you feel that way when you were coaching too, or do you almost feel more like yourself today? Oh, I definitely feel more like myself today. Um, and I don't know if that's just, I don't know if that's that more more uh, a fit for who I am. Yeah. Or if it's kind of the wisdom, just experiences that have made me just. And I work for myself. That's really easy to be yourself when you work for yourself, right? Mm -hmm. But I don't know, towards the end, my, like 2017, 2018, when I was at Ohio State, like I was really, I felt like I finally realized like this, this is how you do this, like at a really high level. Like this is how you are uber successful in coaching. Like I, I got it. I figured it out. And it took a while, but... So I was, I felt like myself those years and I really felt like it was going to be a great life. But the other thing that happened after I got fired that gave me perspective and I guess makes me, makes me say that I feel like I'm more myself now is just seeing my kids more often. 
Like you live in this bubble as a co- in, in college football and really in professional football. Like when you're coaching, I felt like myself as a coach, but hindsight, like that wasn't who I was. Like now I get to, like you said, be this WWE figure, mm-hmm. whatever. This 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 do this entertaining sports show that might have a little knowledge if you if you think, or if not, it's at least entertaining. I can be myself. I can go to a baseball practice, a softball practice, a volleyball tournament. Like I am in my element. Like I've never been happier than I am right now. And I would not, I get asked all the time, I would not trade anything in the world to go back and coach ever. If I got offered a job, I would never do it again. So you do a show every day. Every Is day. it like a 20 minute show? Uh, so it's it's been an hour show during the off season. We've turned it into a, into a two hour show in season just because there's so much more to talk about. Sports wise. Now, are you still like, what is your relationship with Urban like now? No, it doesn't exist. Oh. I have a good relationship with his kids. I mean, you know, I say good relationship. Mm-hmm. It's not like we talk all the time, but but we'll interact. Um, if we see each other, it's 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 good. Um, but Shelly and Urban are like, you know, like we can't we can't talk to him. I mean, so much so that when I did the first interview after I got fired, they were sending texts to my aunt which went to my mom, which went to me saying, hey, we saw your interview. We really appreciate you, you know, telling the truth and standing up for Urban. And I'm like, bitch, you have my phone number. Why Why are you texting my aunt to text my mom to text? Like complete, I don't want to call it cowardice because it's not. It's just he doesn't want any more drama with me so, to the point where, I, he, you know, he lived in, he doesn't anymore. He lived in Dublin. I live in Powell. I was out at a restaurant. He, I, I saw his daughter walk in, and she saw me, and he walked in behind her, and she told him I was at the restaurant, and he kept walking and walked out the back door, never came back. <laughs> I'm like, dude, you can eat dinner. I'm not going to come talk to you. Well, that's unfortunate. Yeah, it is. And it, he's he's got his own share of drama, right? He, he has plenty of drama of his own. Were you surprised when when you saw the, the twerking well, scandal? I was, was that- shocked. Like, he is – not that this is some – you know, this, if being so faith-based and so like the narrative he spit for, I was with him five years at Florida, six years at Ohio State, so 11 years. All I heard about was how, like he talked about his marriage and like like boys trips. And he's like, what is a boys trip? Like if I'm gonna go on a trip, Shelly and I are gonna go somewhere. Right? You know what I mean? It was very like, I was shocked. But did he really do anything on that video? No. So, but- so, so part of me is like almost... Um, it feels like that girl like turned around and kind of did yeah. whatever she did for a second. I mean, was he really culpable there? I'm still on the fence about it. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, but it's just an example too, though. It's like, let's say he was completely, you know, caught off guard or whatever. You just get slandered oh, yeah. in the media. So he should have a little, you know, I mean, like he gets it. Yeah. But he, I don't know. Let's just. Yeah, I don't know. I, I guess, mean, they, uh, they, what do they say? Heavy is the head that wears the crown? Absolutely. That's what it is, right? He he should have taken the team plane back to Jacksonville. I don't know. I mean, yeah. it's just it, unfortunate for him, but I did find it very, very coincidental, almost karmatic, mm-hmm. that his family's reaching out to me about how to deal with the media scrutiny. I'm like, hold on now. <laughs> He is struggling with dealing with this narrative being spin on him. He could have come out and been honest from his lens, but he didn't. He wasn't. He took the coward's route and said what he needed to say, the company line, so he could get out of the messy situation that was my life. I mean, I I sat in a car with Gene Smith, and I love Gene. Right when everything hit the news storm, which is, is a little creepy, I, I got out of the facility. I, I got to go for a walk. I'm walking campus down some back alley, and Gene pulls up on me. I'm like, how did you know where I was? Like, we got tracking devices on the coaches or something. But he pulled up, and I sat in his car, and he was like, how you doing? And I was like, awful, <laughs> like, as you can imagine. And I, I, I honestly thought he was going to fire me. I, I didn't know. I was like, why did he pull up on me like this? And he told me, he was like, listen, we're going to get through this. Like, we know reality. We're going to, you're going to be fine. I know you're probably freaking out right now. We're going to get through this. And that was at like 11 a.m., the day of Big Ten Media Days. And at 4 p.m., I got a phone. I had to sit in Greg Shiano's office and said, Urban needs to talk to you. And I was like, (laughs) I know what it is. Like, I'm fully know what's about to happen. But all Urban said was, hey, Zach, um, with everything that happened today, we're going to have to relieve you of your duties as a coach at Ohio State. 
The only it's the only words I heard from him. He didn't say another thing. Gene took then Gene took the phone and started explaining everything. We're going to take care of your your family. Like we're not going to just fire you. No more paychecks. Like we're gonna, you're going to get paid through the year, and I'm not going to throw your kids on the street. But this is just too much. Like he's talking to me, and I'm sitting here like, I love Gene and everything, but like I've known him for minute. I mean, kind of known him for five years. Like the fact that Urban Meyer could fire me that way was like I'm still shocked about it. Are you though? No. Because uh, let, let's let's rewind the tape. Everything you said about him, it sounds like he's pretty matter of fact. He is guy, but, but I've known him my whole life. Like you would think at some point there would be like a a follow up. <laughs> I mean, but maybe not. I mean, I, it's like I, what I always tell people: I don't need to be Urban Meyer to be my friend. I'm fine, but it's just it's weird. Well, there's still time. There's still time. That's true. Maybe I could maybe I could facilitate an intervention between you and. And Irby, I've got a third microphone. I'm more than willing to Oprah win for your asses. <laughs> that might break YouTube. <laughs> I'm here. Listen, the uh, Carrie Croft show, it's all about it's all about the human experience, whatever well, that may be. I will come back for that show. I love that. I got a feeling the other one's gonna be the hard one to Who land. would we get first? Would we get Courtney or Urban? Which one do you think would have a better shot at getting? Oh God. Ooh, that's a great question. You know? We'll leave you. We'll leave. We'll leave the people with that. Yes. All right, Zach Smith. Thank you so much for being so open, mm -hmm. candid. Mm -hmm. uh, I love the talk about your penis. Um, that was amazing. <laughs> and well, I, that was my favorite part too. I, I really. I mean, that's what stuck with me the most. <laughs> All right, guys. Please continue to follow your girl out there on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. And until next time, keep moving. I appreciate you having me on.